Amen. For the last three weeks, we've been uh, into a series that we've entitled Power in Weakness. Specifically, living in God's power in our human weaknesses. And as a back backdrop to that, we have used and are using Paul's probably most personal letter that he's written in the New Testament, and that is the letter of 2 Corinthians. In this letter of 2 Corinthians, he is the most candid with us in all of his letters, and I like that. I like that Paul is candid with us. I like that Paul is real with us. It seems everybody talks about people aren't real enough anymore. I don't know what that means. I'm almost 50 years old. I've been real for 50 years. And I'm not sure how much reality we can really handle anyway. I mean, if you've seen reality TV, I don't want any more reality TV shows. I don't like them. They're not real anyway. They're scripted, and we know that. But I like in the Bible that Paul is real with us, and he's candid with us, and he, he talks about going through uh, bouts in 2 Corinthians, going through bouts of, of doubts and discouragement, even despairing of life itself. He, he talks about dealing with fears within. And I like that. I like that Paul lets us in on the inside, underneath the, the, the veneer of his life, and shows us he's a real person. I like that because we tend to build superheroes in life. We tend to put people on pedestals where they don't belong, seemingly untouched by the realities of life. But I like it that Paul is real with us in the book of 2 Corinthians. Because that leaves hope for the rest of us. Because if God can work with a real person who went through real situations and real circumstances like Paul did, then that means there's hope for all of us. That God can work in and with all of us in the real lives that we live in the real situations and in the real circumstances of life that often are a struggle in life, that often have trials and troubles and problems with pain. I like it that Paul is real with us, and I like it even better that God works with, in, and through a real person named Paul, because that means he can work in, through, and with real people like me and like you too. Now, the, the book of 2 Corinthians, it obviously culminates in chapter 12, where God says to Paul, my grace is enough for you, my grace is sufficient for you, because my power is perfected in your human weakness. And Paul goes on to say, therefore, I'm going to boast all the more about my weaknesses, because when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's a paradox, to be sure. That sounds contradictory, to be sure. But... Most of the time, that's how God works in our lives. God is a paradox to us. Or is it that we, because we're human and frail and flawed and weak and imperfect, is it that we are a paradox to God? But nonetheless, whatever way it works out, God tells us that his grace is enough for us because his power is made perfect in, in our human weakness. Now, that's where 2 Corinthians culminates, but it's not for sure where it starts. It starts back in chapter 1. Remember when we were there a couple of weeks ago where Paul taught us that God comforts us in all of our trials and in all of our troubles? And how many people know that God's comfort is powerful in our lives? How many of you have known, raise your hands if you've known the comfort of God's power or the power of God's comfort in your life? Amen. Amen. And then after that, still staying in chapter 1, we, we looked at, well, what gets us to the point of God's grace and the point of God's power? And Paul taught us that it was having the simplicity of having a clear conscience. No ulterior motives, no hidden agendas, just open, honest humbleness. My yes is yes, and my no is no, Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, I've been honest with you and upfront with you, and I have a clear conscience with you from the get-go. So it seems to me that as long as we just keep a clear conscience, having no ulterior motives or no hidden agendas, but just some humble honesty, it seems that humble honesty is what gets us to the point of God's grace and God's power being perfected in our lives. And then remember, last week, we looked at the power of God's forgiveness in our lives that frees us from the hurt of the offense 
as it frees us, remember this, from Satan's schemes to cause division in relationships because of the offenses and to cause the bondage of bitterness in people's lives, also because of offenses. Remember how we talk about how Satan stands in the shadows and on the sidelines of our lives, scheming to cause division to come between people and to cause bitterness rooted in the person who was offended because he lives to kill, steal, and destroy aspects of our lives. But remember, it was Paul who said to the Corinthians, look, you need to forgive that offending person because I already have. I live in the freedom of God's forgiveness, and Paul said, and I want you to live there too. I don't want, let, I don't want you to let Satan to cause division to come among you in the Corinthian church. And I don't want you to have a root of bitterness that would spring up in your life. Paul says, I know the power of God's forgiveness. I've already forgiven that person. And I want you to forgive that person too. This week, what I want to look at as we continue looking at God's power in our weakness, is I want to look at chapter 4. Take your Bibles, if you have them with you this morning, and turn them to chapter 4. If you didn't bring your Bibles with you this morning, look on them. Make, make a friend. Look on to your neighbor's Bible. Share your Bible with whoever's sitting next to you. Because I want to read a chunk of that chapter this morning. Too much to put up on the screen at any one time. I want to read about God's power and our weaknesses in chapter 4, the way Paul framed it, the way the Holy Spirit through Paul framed it when Paul said, He's given us this treasure. In jars of clay. When I think about the fragileness of life, when I think about jars of clay, I think about fragileness, things that are easily broken. I don't do well with pottery. I don't know if you do, but I've broken many a pottery thing in my mom's home when I was growing up. They're so fragile. They break so easily, which is why we don't have much pottery in the house, I suppose. Mom talked to you probably before she died, I'm assuming, not after. When I think of fragileness, I, I think of jars of clay. When I think of jars of clay, I think of fragileness. When I think of the fragileness of life in jars of clay, I naturally think of Mary's alabaster box in Matthew 26 and in John 12. Remember that alabaster box that was so easily broken and spilled out and used to anoint Jesus for his death before he died. I think of the paradox of putting putting something so extravagantly expensive as that expensive anointing oil perfume in something that is so fragile and easily breakable as an alabaster box or a, a, a jar of clay. When I, when I think of the alabaster box that Mary had in the Gospels, and I think of the jar of clay, the jars of clay that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, I think of us. We, Christians, are God's jars of clay. That he puts inside of us an extravagant, expensive empowerment that most days of the week we don't give a thought to in the fragileness of our lives. You know, life is fragile. And life certainly isn't always easy. But we have an intrinsic power, an intrinsic presence, a transcendent power and presence of incredible, enormous value inside of us. It is therefore ironic that we spend so much time focusing on and worrying about the, the aesthetics of the outside when it's really what's on the inside that counts. I mean, we, we worry so much about how we look. Is the hair done just right? Did I use enough hairspray on it today? Do I look good in this shirt? Do I look good in this vest? Do the shoes coordinate with my pants that coordinates with my shirt that coordinates with my vest? I'm just telling you my morning routine this morning, right before I went to Vicki and said, does this work? <laughs> Some
Somebody asked me this morning, what color is your shirt? I said, I really don't know. <laughs> I think it's pink. But I'm secure enough in my own masculinity that I can wear pink. <laughs> and I'm wearing a vest this morning just to hold in all of the turkey that I ate over the last few days. Seriously, somebody said, oh, you have no problem with it. You have no idea how much I suck in every day of the week. Ask Karen, I go home and I exhale and I always go, Bleh. <laughs> I like having fun, I hope you do too. <laughs> but we spend so much time worrying about what's on the outside of us. We forget it's what's on the inside that counts. We spend so much time worrying about what the outside of that alabaster jar of clay must have looked like that we forget it's what's on the inside of it that really matters mm -hmm. in life. You see, treasure is something of intrinsic value and enduring power that you always put on the inside of something. You don't just leave treasure laying out in the open. You put treasure in a vault. You put treasure in a, in a safety deposit box. You put treasure in a safe. You know where God put his treasure? In jars of clay. What a paradox that is. And the treasure that we carry inside of ourselves certainly includes what Paul said in verse 10. Because very plainly, Paul said in verse 10, we carry inside of ourselves the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in us. And that is certainly true. There is nothing of more intrinsic value or great eternal power that you or I have in our lives than the life and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the whole ball of wax right there. Jesus is everything. And without him, we are nothing but an empty jar of clay. But because we carry Christ in us, our empty jars of clay become filled and it gives our lives value and eternal power. Now, if you follow the context and the continuity from chapter 3 to chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, and if you follow the context of most of the New Testament, you will also see that it is the Holy Spirit of Christ that is the treasure in our jars of clay. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Come with me back to uh, the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus said, my Father is going to give you a gift, and this gift is not going to just be with you, it's going to be in you, the promise of his Holy Spirit. He's going to counsel you, he's going to convict you, he's going to comfort you. In Acts 1, 8, Jesus said, this gift of the promise of the power of God in you is going to empower your lives. And, and the promise of the Holy Spirit of God, this treasure that's in our jars of clay, is going to affect, change, and influence our character with God's character. Hopefully making us more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more good, more kind, more gentle, more faithful, and more self-controlled. And then Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, that it's this same gift of the power of the treasure of the Holy Spirit of God in us that God uses to do his miracles and his manifestations in the way we think, in the things we say, and in the miracle power that we are able to live our lives with as God guides and directs us. And the bottom line to all of that starts in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, he's not going to just be with you, he is in you. The Holy Spirit is not with you. Holy Spirit of God, the essence of God, is in you. Wow. You know, we went to see the Lion King on Friday downtown in the, uh, the Milwaukee Theater thing. And it's a spectacular musical. I mean, seriously. The visual effects will blow you away. It is so cool. It's a Broadway show, and they do it up right now. And we saw the movie beforehand, so we knew what happened. We weren't scared when Mufasa fell and Scar let him go. We weren't scared when the little cub kid, I forget his name, ran away. 
Simba. <laughs> and we knew Timon and Pumbaa would eventually find him, so it would be all right. And who can't like Scar? I mean, he's a likable guy. He's a likable villain. You know, he's a bad guy you, you like. I don't know why. It's his voice or something. But there was a line in the musical and in the movie that as soon as it came out, the Holy Spirit hit me upside the back of the head and said, that's it. The line is four words. He lives in you. It's, it's part of a song in the movie and in the musical. He lives in you. And I thought to myself, that is so true for the Christian. It shouldn't be relegated to Lion King movies and musicals. What is the intrinsic, eternal truth of Christianity? That the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And I think if more Christians thought this way, more often we would live more like God wants us to live. We might be more loving, more joyful, and more peaceful and patient and self-controlled. If we lived in the reality that he's not just with us, he's within us. But I think most Christians live with the mindset that the Holy Spirit is with us. You don't get it, church. He's not with you. The Holy Spirit of God, Jesus said, is within you. We have nothing of more intrinsic value and eternal power in our lives than the life and the death of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ in us. That's what Paul meant when he said we have this treasure in jars of clay that shows this all-surpassing power in us is from God and not from ourselves. You know, for weeks you've seen a, a picture uh, in the lower left-hand corner of, of these two hands. I love this picture. Tasha actually found it for me. She, weeks before we started the series, I, I told her what I wanted the backgrounds to look like and everything. And, and I really love this picture. She came up with it. I had no clue we were going to do hands, but when she said, I, 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 I fell in love with it because it, it reminds me of a father holding a son or a daughter's hand. It reminds me of a father holding a child's hand. The imagery reminds me of how our Heavenly Father, through His Holy Spirit in us, holds us, and helps us, and leads us, and guides us, and strengthens us, and, and stabilizes us in life, every day, in every way, all the way, from here to heaven. This is Thanksgiving weekend, in case you didn't. Because you're thankful, or if you're thankful, I'm assuming you're thankful, for the abiding, peaceful presence and power of God's Holy Spirit in you. I mean, if you're really, truly thankful for that, if you're thankful for the Holy Spirit of God in your jar of clay, why don't you allow God to do something in you this week, in the lives of people around you? Why don't you allow God to do something in you this week, in the lives of people around you this week, that maybe you don't think you could do? Maybe you think, oh, it's too hard, oh, it's too difficult, or whatever. Don't worry about it. Nothing, Scripture tells me nothing is impossible with God. And God tells us in His Scripture that His power is perfected in our weakness. You see... When we're working with God outside of our own comfort zone, when we're working with God sometimes in the areas of our weaknesses, we're no more powerful in those times than when we're simply allowing God to take over and God to do his thing in us and through us. That's exactly what Paul did in his life. That's how Paul lived his life. And Paul, I believe, was thankful for the treasure that God put in his jar. If that's you, if you're thankful for the Holy Spirit of God in you this week, then let God do something through you in the
the life or lives of people around you. Maybe it's going to be at home. Maybe it's going to be at school or at work. Maybe it's in church. Maybe it's going to be out there in the community. And maybe you're going to think, well, I don't know. Your hesitancy, initial hesitancy, but I don't know. Step outside your hesitancy. Step inside the holiness. And let God strengthen you in, in your weaknesses. God strengthen you. Have you ever wondered why you live with a passion? And a power and a compelling to share the love of Jesus with people around you? It's because of the Holy Spirit within you. It's the Holy Spirit prompting you to do those things. It's because of the treasure and jars of clay that you just can't wait to share with people around you. But listen to me. If you don't have that passion for sharing the love of Jesus with people around you, then I would say this. Let God strengthen the weak areas of your witnessing. If you're a little afraid, don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. Fear of man is a trap. Trust in the Lord, a person is kept safe. Let God strengthen the weak areas of witnessing. We all want to be great witnesses for Christ. Sometimes our weaknesses hold us back from being the type of people we want to be. Maybe that's what you can let God do in you and through you this week. Because you love and appreciate him so much. Share the love of God and Jesus Christ with someone around you this week. Don't worry about your weaknesses. Because God perfects his power in our weaknesses. So live outside yourselves this week by living in the power of God in you. God's treasure 